I hate readings. I can never focus through the entirety of one. Even when I try and, uh, and you know, I like the author, you know, I'm at that book launch, I like the author, I want to support their book, my eyes glaze over. I think it's because a reading uh, at one of these launches, if it's, if it's a novel or even if it's a short story, you never have any context or very limited context. And you're sitting there thinking, well, who's that character again? Why do I care? I've forgotten her name. Why is she, what's she doing? Um, because these readings can never be a thing in themselves. They never can be complete. They can never speak for themselves. Um, now you don't have to do a reading for this right around the Murray uh, uh, things we love video, but it's kind of in the, it's in the blurb there, song or reading. Um, but it's kind of sort of expected. See, I see readings as a, I've always seen readings as an avenue to why. Because when you go to a book launch, remember book launches? <laughs> um, when you go to a book launch, you know, there's going to be wine there. And this thing standing in between you and the wine is this thing where you have, your eyes have to glaze over a little bit. When I did my book launch, I, had, I didn't have a reading. I just kind of, a little bit of a chat, a bit of a talk, and then boom, we're right into the wine. I'm Tian Napa, by the way. I'm a science fiction writer. I do have a collection out. I've got a debut novel coming out early next year, but we're not really here for that. Um, what's important today is I'm going to do two readings for you after all that preamble. Um, I'm giving you two for the price of one. And how can I over overcome the problem of readings? Well, you'll see. You'll see. Maybe I can't overcome the problem. Maybe your eyes are glazed already, but we shall see. Um, I'd love to do a science fiction reading, being a science fiction author, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that, partly because of what I, the reasons I articulated earlier. I will say that science fiction matters. Um, it matters just as much as any other literature. In some ways, it matters more than ever, ever, more than ever. But don't take my word for it. Take the words of Ursula Le Guin, one of the greatest American writers of all time. Um, she gave a great speech at when she was receiving the Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters from the National Book Foundation. This is right at the very end of her career. So these are the words of Ursula Le Guin. And I rejoice in accepting it for and sharing it with all the writers who've been excluded from literature for so long. My fellow authors of fantasy and science fiction, writers of the imagination, who for 50 years have watched the beautiful rewards go to the so-called realists. Hard times are coming. When we'll be wanting the voices of writers who can see alternatives to how we live now, can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being. And even imagine real grounds for hope. We'll need writers who can remember freedom, poets and visionaries, realists of a larger reality. Right now, we need writers who know the difference between production of a market commodity and the practice of an art, developing written material to suit strategies, sales strategies in order to maximize, cor maximize corporate profit and advertising revenue is not the same thing as responsible book publishing or authorship. And I see a lot of us, the producers who write the books and make the books, accepting this, letting commodity profiteers sell us like deodorant and tell us what to publish and what to write. Context, this is me speaking. Le Guin was giving this speech to a room full of industry people, but in that room was Amazon. And I think she was clearly taking a pot shot at them as, as part of the ceremony. Back to Ursula. Books just aren't commodities. The profit motive is often in conflict with the aims of art. We live in capitalism and its power seems inescapable. But then so too did the, did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. 
Resistance and change often begins in art and very often in our art, the art of words. I've had a long career as a writer and a good one in good company. Here at the end of it, I don't want to watch American literature. Straight into it. American literature gets sold down the river. We who live by writing and publishing want and should demand our fair share of the proceeds, but the name of our beautiful reward is not profit. Its name is freedom. Pretty good, huh? Words I love if we're talking about the things we love as a theme. Ursula Le Guin was a firebrand right to the end. Unfortunately, she died two or three years ago. I don't know exactly when, uh, maybe even three. So she did. She died before the pandemic, and she and she passed before um, our our present became increasingly science fictional. So I'm. I, I said I wouldn't talk too much about cyber but science fiction, but I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to talk about cyberpunk, which is what I write. Now, why does it matter? Why does cyberpunk matter? It matters because we live in a cyberpunk present. We live in a world where China has unfurled a system of high-tech mass surveillance across the country, a so-called social credit scheme that rates the political and social rectitude of its citizens and punishes them if they diverge from the party line. In the United States and elsewhere, Australia, giant corporations have more power than ever before, impoverishing their workforces while the owners simultaneously become the richest people in human history. Russia, meanwhile, prosecutes PSYOPs operations against the West using data harvested by uh, Western social media companies. Deep fakes, fake news and server hacks. High-tech disinformation campaigns from a rogue mafia state led by a former KGB general, a uh, colonel, colonel. This is the stuff of cyberpunk. Cyberpunk saw this 40 years ago. They foretold it and that future came to pass. Um, so it does give us shape and meaning to our lives. I'm getting a phone call uh, and I'm uh, not gonna edit this because I, I don't know how to edit Zoom. So I'm just gonna turn this off, sorry. So it does give shape and meaning to our lives and is a subgenre that I'm obsessed with. But is it something that I love? Do I love living in a cyberpunk present? I don't, I don't know if I do. Do I love that we are living increasingly in a science fiction dystopia? These, these surveillance technologies are, are permeating every aspect of our lives. I don't know. So I'm not gonna read you cyberpunk, I'm gonna read you a poem. And the reason I can read you a poem is because a poem, back to the beginning of, back to my thesis at the beginning is, a poem is a thing in itself. It is complete and it speaks for itself. Now I read this poem at my grandmother's funeral. Um, so I'll give you that context, uh, that even in death, there is so much for which we can be grateful. The poem mentions God, but I don't think it means God, God. I think it means the universe. It means that even, the dark, even in the dark days of this pandemic, there are little things that we can appreciate, blessings we can count. The poem is quite famous. It's called Let Evening Come by Jane Kenyon. Let the light of late afternoon shine through the chinks in the barn, moving up the bales as the sun moves down. Let the crickets take up chafing as a woman takes up her needles and her yarn. Let evening come. Let the dew collect on the hoe abandoned in long grass, let the stars appear and the moon disclose her silver horn. Let the fox go back to its sandy den, let the wind die down, let the shed go black inside and let evening come. Let it come as it will and don't be afraid. God does not leave us comfortless. So let evening come. Thank you. <laughs>